talk about um, what's it called? Millennials. Muslim millennials, yes, millennials. and topics that are relevant to young people yeah. um, in relation to their Islam, but making that practical. We're discussing Muslim millennials. Yeah. What's relevant to them? Right. So, how would you introduce God? From some or to some extent, you're talking about reintroducing God to people who already know about God. Yeah. But knowing God or discussions of God are based on particular conceptualizations. Yeah. So if there is already a conceptualization on the table and we're bringing God to the table in a way that differs to that initial conceptualization, then we're reintroducing. But when you reintroduce God, is it going to be an abstract discussion? Is it going to be academic? Yeah. Yeah. Is this discussion going to be academic, for example? No, no it's not going to be relevant. Then. Yeah. yeah. People aren't feeling that kind of conversation. Right? From my own experiences, it seems that people want to know how to do God in life. Not, let me switch off the button. Let me switch off life. Let me find a corner, do God in the corner. So making it practical. Yeah. yeah. So let me do God in the corner with some spiders, <laughs> some spider webs. And then I'll go back into the real world and be what exactly? Mm. Because if you're leaving God in the corner, yeah, mm. wh- what are you doing there? And then when you claim to be Muslim there, then what's that over there? Exactly. Yeah, so th- that conversation goes. So I don't know, you tell me what's important to millennials. What are they about? What are they doing? What are they saying? How would they like God to factor in? So straight away, what comes to mind is in doing God is that a lot of young Muslim millennials, even though they consider themselves to be British, they consider themselves to be a part of this culture, they're involved in this culture, they're part and parcel of this social fabric, but it's almost like their conceptualization of God is very cultural, mm. first of all. Even though they're not from that culture, but they've been taught in Madaris, who are just basically Madaris nowadays are still like mini Pakistans or mini Bangladeshis or mini Indias or mini even West African places. Mm. But that's what it is in the UK. So they're saying, okay, our notion of God or conceptualization of God is very cultural on our parents' culture, on our grandparents' culture. So how do we do God in the Western context mm. that feels authentic and British and feels like it's God is relevant to us? Mm. So when you say cultural, for example, one might argue you can't escape culture. So if you're not going to be doing God in that mini India, mini Pakistan, mini Somalia, yeah. mini Nigeria, yeah. mini Ghana, so on, way, then you're still talking about it in a British way. You can't be a cultural. Yeah. So then how would the millennial respond to that? In that sense, we'll say that we feel British though. Mm-hmm. We feel a part of this of this society. This is what we know. So the problem isn't actually them being cultural. No. It's the particular culture cultural. that's being appropriated and the lens through which we're looking at God and how being godly mm-hmm. is relevant mm-hmm. or, or how that's applied yeah. to living. Because I guess when we're talking about culture, the cultural aspect of theology, and when I say theology, like your beliefs, your yeah. abstract beliefs, yeah, yeah, yeah. your general dogma, your doctrines and so on, what you're essentially talking about is how those apply to the life you're living exactly. and the lifestyle you're living. Exactly. So... We do believe in an Islam that is imbued in culture, but the question is, which one should it be imbued in? Yeah. But some of people say, well, you've got insular society, insular communities. Yeah. Yeah. Around England. You know, yeah, of Leicester, course. Leicester, Birmingham, even in London, you have... No, but up north, let's say up north, yeah, Bradford, up north, you yeah. know. <laughs> people say, oh, it's a Londoner, so he's in London as if it's Yeah, amazing, exactly. Right? But even in London, you've got boroughs in certain areas um, that are quite insular. Um, with ethno-cultural communities, of and ethno-religious communities. So some of them will say, well, if it's an Indian community, then what's wrong with doing Indian Islam in an Indian community? What's wrong with doing Nigerian Islam in a Nigerian British community? But the issue with that is what, you, what you're going to have is you have the shift in millennials has been, it's changing. Mm-hmm. So for example, you find more millennials are, you know, maybe their parents weren't university graduates, mm-hmm. but young people are now going to university, young people are going to SOAS, these, you know, these kind of institutes and academic institutes in the UK. So now they're also learning their Islam from there as well. So now it's almost like this combat, it's almost like this battle between, okay, these people are telling me Islam is like this in my university. Mm-hmm. And these people are, t- and what I've learned Islam to be is at odds with this. So now which one is correct? Mm. 
So it goes, I guess, back to relevance and the lifestyles we live. Exactly. But given that we live, and again, I'm just asking these questions because they help us to probe deeply into what to do. Yeah. You know, as most people know in Adab al-Mufti, that subject yeah. and how to give fatwa, yeah. for example, most people are fully aware, um, or at least most mujtahids and qadis and, and muftis should be aware that half of the... I'm going to stop you there. What are these terms? Okay. <laughs> I know what they are, but... <laughs> no, it's not that. It's like... They're so deep and um, they're so open to misconstructions yeah. and and uh, misinterpretations. So um, just general, yeah. we could talk about this later perhaps. Okay, yeah, but, cool. Um, but the Qadi is a judge. Yeah. The Mufti is somebody who gives religious verdicts, but yeah. they're not particularly binding. Okay. Because you need the, the, the power of the law, yeah. politics behind you, which is judge and the judiciary. So a Mufti is someone who gives legal verdicts, more kind of like a legal specialist. Okay. And what was the other one I used? Oh, the Mufti, I believe. Mufti, Qadi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, for them to understand or, or for them to know what to say or how to advise or how to provide counsel or to give judgment, um, is half of that might be predicated on understanding what God has said yeah. um, through direct revelation or through his messenger. So, that's one. But the other side is understanding what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You're getting into it. So even when we talk about Muslim millennials, of course, they're not a homogenous group, uh, mm-hmm. are they? Right? So you've got different cultures. Yeah. So you might have you might have one, for example, I'm not saying they, their heritage goes back to someone in West Africa, someone else from the subcontinent in Asia, mm-hmm. for example. So one, you've got kind of like an Anglo-Asian or Anglo-Indian or Anglo-Pakistani yeah. um, kind of cultural background. Um, and then on the other side, you have this anglo um, West African and you know the, the, the different tribes and the different cultures that come from there, the Hausa, the Igbo and so on um, and then obviously between the two a bit like a Venn diagram you're going to have that bit in the middle where they share but I think that Venn diagram is expanding now ah, okay. so I feel like that that kind of it's called the third culture oh, Okay. so the third culture is that this idea that more and more of us are becoming even though we have different backgrounds so mm. for example me my parents were born in Gambia even I was born in Gambia mm. but I feel more at home in the UK and with a British Pakistani, I feel more in common with their culture. For example, our music will be the same. Mm-hmm. Our interests will be the same. Our cultural, our you know, our vernacular, the, w- the words that we use are the same. Mm-hmm. More than someone from the Gambia or someone from Pakistan. So this is so this idea that we share such a wide culture. And how does our Islam relate to this now? Mm. Do you think that way of thinking yeah. uh, and those challenges, perhaps? Yeah are shared across people who come from different heritages? From my experience, yes, but I, I recognize my experience might be very limited, but I feel, I feel it's not. I feel more and more so it's becoming more in common and more shared. Because mm. then, you know, this is the way forward then. So if there's a third culture, it's about people like myself and others like yourself, actually, you know, deeply understanding yeah. the intuitions, the aspirations, um, of people who come from this third culture and, yeah. to, in, and in, in some way to, to be a part of that as well. Yeah. I think it's very difficult to speak about a culture from outside of it. Of course. Because even the way you talk about those things, um, in order for it to be able to relate <clears throat> to people, yeah. generally speaking, um, it's very hard to know what relates to people unless you're part of that. And to be fair, I don't think that's something that goes for millennials. I think it's for generations that even came before them. I mm-hmm. think as long as you're born and raised here, there's going to be, there's always going to be that shared space yeah. in which there's that shared cultural element, yeah, you know, that course. shared religious cultural <clears throat> element yeah. that that is rooted and based in going to primary school, secondary school, college, sixth form, university. Yeah. Um, you know, the same places like, you know, the, the pool club, the snooker hall, football clubs, you know, where people might gather, whether they're sports, recreation, you know, just socialising, you know, just kicking it down in the park, for example. Mm-hmm. So there is a shared culture that builds in those spaces, the things that you talk about. You know, I remember um, when I was in secondary school, there was this kid who'd just come from Pakistan. Yeah. Right? Like fresh, fresh. <laughs> off the PIA, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, he'd come to Pakistan within three weeks. Yeah, uh, this shows you my age. Within three weeks, the guy had like memorized like different songs of Biggie, for example. He couldn't even speak English properly. He that. <laughs> yeah, so he's already being introduced and socialized into a culture, right? Um, 
even though he hasn't got all of the other manifest parts. So probably at home, I don't know what language he spoke with his Punjabi or Urdu, whatever. Yeah. But he probably spoke a language because he couldn't speak English fluently. Really. Yeah. So he would speak those languages at home, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, he probably went to Madras or something. So he's got different aspects of his life. But there's a shared culture that's now forming in his life. Yeah. Um, being in secondary school with us, so definitely that was always going to be the case. Yeah. And I think so. I don't think it's one of those where people will say, "Oh, those people who are slightly like a decade older than us, for example, um, they don't understand us." I think, if anything, those are the people that are going to understand you the best. Agreed. And what's really interesting is something I was actually thinking about the other day. In some ways, who are the millennials going to look to for that kind of guidance? Of course, someone... It's going to have to be the people who are decade... Agreed. Yeah, older to them. Of course. Older than them, because the people that age don't have the specialism. But then, having said that's true, but having said that, you get people who, may say your generation, yeah. born and raised in the UK, yeah. but their education has been so... Whereas it's going to be Madrasa education, they don't... Millennials don't relate to that culture. So we have... So we, in 2018, yes, it's less, but we're having conversations about, I don't know, clothing... Mm -hmm. We're having conversations about clothing. We're having conversations about the beard length. We're having conversations mm -hmm. about uh, going to the cinema. Mm -hmm. But it's a process of crystallization, right? So yeah. you've got like the generation not before me, but the one before that, yeah. perhaps, or the one before that. They were the immigrants. Yeah. So they came. Then they had their kids. Yeah. Yeah. So first generation. Second. Then you've got second generation. So things start to peter out. Yeah. Now there's two points here. One. Generally, across all people yeah. of that generation, things peter out. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and things are adopted. So that's one. But also, some of them, it peters, peters out more. The foreign culture peters out more, and they adopt more of 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 the culture they're born and raised in. Yeah, right. The environment more so than other groups. Well, I'm just gonna throw, and, I'm just gonna throw it out there then. Yeah. All this adopting cultural stuff sounds like people are saying you are imitating the kuffar, you are imitating the non-Muslims, you are imitating uh, British culture, which is actually anti-Islam. Yeah, but if you're from India, you just came from Hindu land. <laughs> yeah, so, how does that one work? You know, if you're Nigerian or Ghanaian, you've also come from places that massive groups of people are Christian. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's quite an irony when people come from multi-faith countries. Yeah. Maybe if you came from Pakistan, but even in Pakistan, you've got all sorts going on, <laughs> right? So you've got the Ubundi groups and Takfir and Brelwi groups, and, and you've got the Shiites there, you've got Qadianis there, you've got Pakistani Christians there. Yeah. So it's not like there's this homogenous Islamicness going on, yeah. right? According to one group of people, everybody else in the country is a kafir, all of the other groups, mm. and vice versa. So even from their positions, there's a lot of multi-faith going on. So let's be frank. The people who really kind of push this. Yeah. Yeah, let's be honest, right? I've never heard really West Africans saying this stuff. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I've never really heard East Africans saying this stuff. I've never really heard North Africans, perhaps because of French colonialism. <laughs> yeah. But Algerian stuff and, and, and people from Morocco, I've never really heard this. Mm. This is really those people who were, one, either under, yeah, the odious, the odious effects of colonialism in the British Raj, yeah. the subcontinent, or the rise in particular forms of thinking in the Middle East, post-colonial thinking in the Middle East, yeah. which understandably, right, um, you know, push against Western imperialism and they see cultural imperialism as a form of that. Yeah. Which I completely recognise if you live there. Mm. Yeah, so if your culture is wearing, I don't know, like when we were in Egypt, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the thobes that they wear, that those long kind yeah. of stuff, or whatever, you know, Egyptians wear, or in Saudi Arabia, you've got your thobe and your shimar and your iqal, and actually around the Khalid. Yeah. And then you feel that somebody's now imposing a suit on you, a badla, or a yeah. you know, three-piece suit, or trousers and a shirt, and you, you don't want to conform. Then you shouldn't. It's your country. Make it happen. But the question is then here, then, is there anything such as thing as Islamic dress? Oh, shut up, no. But I think everybody knows this much to be the case because mm. clothing is, the asal of clothing is that it's orphan. It's yeah. urfi, right? So it's to do with customs and habits. Yeah. Right? But look it, looking like, like a Muslim, for example. But what is looking like a Muslim? So, for example, in the Prophet Sallallahu time, um, Mughira ibn Sha'ba, he narrates, and this hadith is in Bukhari, a Muslim, yeah. that the Prophet Sallallahu used to wear a jubba rumiya. Exactly. Yeah? Yeah. And even Ibn Hajar al-Sqalani, he says it was made of uh, um, um, suf, yeah. wool, mm -hmm. right? And it was in the style of the Romans. Yeah. So for all intents and purposes, you had somebody from the Hijaz, today's Khalij, 
were in Western clothing. <laughs> and they're almost, they're Western clothing. So the Prophet wore Western clothing. And yeah. if somebody tells me, as a Westerner, I'm not allowed to wear Western clothing. There's something a bit messed up in that. Yeah. Now some people will come back and say, but what about Umar ibn Khattab in Sahih al-Bukhari? He said, Iyakum, mm-hmm. um, um, Azia al-Mushrikeen, or there's other narrations where he says, Ziyah al-Mushrikeen. Yeah. And that was when he was given advice to the armies that were in Azerbaijan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what was he talking to? Yeah, and the whole kind of like, you know, people generally apply the statement, um, which I know some people have a problem with. Yeah. Um, but people like um, Hafid al Iraqi, the teacher. Do you mind just translating that hadith? Oh, mental, <laughs> whoever imitates the people is from amongst them, yeah. is considered from amongst those people. Um, people like Hafid al Iraqi and others said it was Sahih. But in any case, just making those points in case someone says, oh, that's weak. According to some hadith, and according to others, it okay. wasn't. But in any case, that hadith in and of itself, if we accept it, yeah. to shabu in what sense? Mm. Yeah? So, I'm imi- imi- well, talking about imitation in what sense? Yeah, imitation. Sorry, yeah, sorry. To shabu meaning imitation. Imitation yeah. in what sense? Yeah. I eat, they eat. I've imitated them. <laughs> oh, course. those are human needs. Okay, but human needs are clothing. Oh, no, but that's to do with style. Okay, style is imitation. But what about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where Salah. it was said that he used to kind of hib, he used to love muwafaqat ahli kitab. He used to like being in agreement with ahli kitab yeah. in culture. When he moved to Medina, changing his, changing his hair like the yeah, Jews. exactly, and yeah. so on, right? Rather than being like the pagans, yeah. the Hindus. Yeah. And I always say this to some of the, our brethren, um, especially from the Salvation continent who come from India, yeah. who push... Um, I think in the Gujaratis call it the kafni and um, or the shalwa kameez. Yeah. And they say, oh no, you should be wearing this instead of jeans and a shirt. <laughs> well, I say, well, jeans and shirt, why? Because it's Christian. And they say, yes. Isn't it better muwafaqat ahli kitab than muwafaqat who? The pagans. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So clearly, if we're going to do muwafaqa, I'm in a better place than you are. Being in agreement with them. Yeah. Muwafaqat, yeah. yeah. Muwafaqa being in agreement with yeah. cultural alignment. Cultural alignment. Yeah. Then... Surely, I'm in a better state than you are. I'm actually following the sunnah. Or not. <laughs> the irony. That's one. Yeah, the irony. Number two, let's be frank. What did the Prophet ﷺ change and say, sorry, we can't dress like this anymore because the pagans did. Mm-hmm. It was Arab dress. That's yeah. what they wore in Mecca. That's what they wore in Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ would do that. Yeah. As well as that we know, for example, we said Jubba Rumiya. Yeah. And he also used to wear a cloak from Yemen. Yeah. And Yemen at that time was what? Yeah. Jewish. Yeah? Mm. Remember, Mu'adh ibn Jabal was sent to them. Yeah. yeah. And what did the Prophet say in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, which is Bukhari Muslim? Innaka satati qawma ahli kitab. No. You will come to a nation of the people of the book. Yeah. So they were Jews and Christians in Yemen. Right? We, we know it was close. Like you had the Christians of Najran, yeah. which is like really on the border of today's Yemen, really deep south. So there were a lot of ahli kitab yeah. there at the time. That initially tells us that culturally speaking, the Prophet himself was multi <laughs> in his dress. Right, so that's one. Number two, when we talk about tashabbu, yeah, we're talking about emulation or resemblance or copying. Yeah. Number one, I'm not copying the West. I'm a Westerner. Yeah. If you have a sense of belonging problem, then that's you. <laughs> I, I adopt the West. Yeah. I am the West. Yeah, yeah. I was born here. I was raised here. Educated. The, the irony is most of my fa- most of my family aren't even Muslims. Yeah. Yeah, and so on. So, um, you know. To talk about adopting the West or being, you're trying to be Western. I'm not trying, I am. Now, if you don't feel that way, if you feel home is somewhere else, that's fine. You have the right to do, you have the political right to do that. Yeah. And perhaps from a psychological perspective, you know, I, I would I, I feel pity for your cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and if you had advised, you get on a plane and, and go where you feel more at home. But then, Sheikh, surely then, what are the Sharia guidelines? Because people are going to say the West is so corrupt, especially you, you young people are getting so corrupt. What is the... Are they? Like a BBC just released an article yeah. right, a couple of days ago showing that in fact in ethics and morals, right, the younger generations... The, uh, the irony. Yeah. I read the I, same I thing on the Independent. Yeah. So they're doing better. Like, for example, they don't booze up as much. Yeah. They, they, and, and it's not just a matter of drinking alcohol. They don't booze up, take drugs. As a result, as well behavior is much yeah. lower you know, than the older generation. So to say that, oh, it's so bad, it's such a great fitna, a'udhu billah. No, I think these actually reflect mm-hmm. cultural and immigrant kind of anxieties mm-hmm. that are then inherited by later generations of post-immigrant communities. 
Mm. Because when we look at the facts on the ground, that's not the case. And even the point about alcohol, so what? Yes, we know it's an evil because Allah Azza wa says about يَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ in the Quran. So they ask you about um, intoxication and games of uh, you know, chant, yeah. basically dash rolling and so on. And tell them it's a harm. Yeah, there is benefit in it. Yes. Yeah, well, mm. if, أَكْبَرُ مِن نَفْعِهِمَا but the ithim and what happens as a result is greater than the benefit, benefit that you will attain from those things. So if you're drinking, people will say, oh, the benefit of socializing, chilling yeah. out. Some people, though, it's been debunked now that red wine is a bit of good for your heart and so on. But the harms of intoxication, you know, let's be right, alcohol as a pure substance is poison, basically. Yeah. And, and consuming poison can never be a good thing. <laughs> so looking at it like that, Allah talks about in the Quran. But remember, the believers drank. The believers drunk. So somebody who converted right at the beginning, the Prophet Sallallahu didn't, and Abu Bakr didn't, yeah. but others did, yeah. right? And the believers drank throughout Mecca and into to Medina. Medina. Mm. Yeah. So to say, oh, that culture is completely evil and X, Y, Z, what are you saying? Mm. Yeah? yeah. That's that's the question. What exactly are you saying? To say, oh, look, we live in a culture where they socialize with alcohol. So did the Sahaba mm. in Islam. Not the Sahaba as pagans, the Sahaba as believers. Well, they, This hadith in Bukhari, right? So Anas ibn Malik is actually talking about how he used to serve drinks to people like Muhammad ibn Sufyan. Like a bar kind yeah, of thing. Like, like, mock- like, like cocktails. Yeah, yeah. Cocktails. <laughs> and, he, and these are the hadith about the prohibition of alcohol. So you're saying before that, I was kind of like the bar. The barman. Yeah, the barman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to bring the drinks in, in the houses of Abu Talha. Abu Talha was the richest Sahabi in Medina. And I used to serve them and then he's going through what kind of drinks he's serving, what kind of cocktails he would make for them. <laughs> so they socialize. So to say it can't come to an end is nonsense. Number two, as I said, with the millennials think they are drinking this. There's a shift. And as we've seen anyway, there's been a big shift in like pubs and bars to yeah. coffee shops exactly. and tea houses. And the whole millennial hipster yeah, kind of exactly. culture. Exactly. Just like being you know, woke. And probably there was probably a time when they said the same thing about beards. Yeah. Oh, people never grow beards. And now look, everyone's everybody's here. everyone is growing beard. It's actually the norm not to see somebody, you know, with a clean shave, even yeah. like just designer stubble. And yeah. I'm talking about it from a point of general culture. So cultures change. Mm-hmm. So the question is, where are these sentiments coming from if the facts and the realities on the ground sure. do not reflect them? Mm-hmm. They are definitely a form of anxieties that exist. And, and it's a form of pessimism that's rooted in those anxieties. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 think, I think it's wonderful now. And I see it getting better. But then what are the sh- are there Sharia guidelines for what is acceptable culture and what is unacceptable culture? Well, culture is a big term, right? Yeah. And culture pervades every aspect of life. Oh, exactly. So the Sharia tells us things in life yeah. you know, that we shouldn't do. Yeah. Right? And then it lets you do everything else. And yeah. there's some things that you should do, like offer prayer and so forth. Yeah. What God wants. Yeah. Yeah. So just going back to the Tashabbuh al qawm issue imitating yeah the people. imitating people so when we look at imitation we need to first determine and i'll come back to your question in a moment we need to determine what we mean by tashabbu okay. and what form of tashabbu is haram okay yeah now there's one form of tashabbu that's always overlooked funny okay. enough one form of imitation yeah so but the imitation that people look to are always the superficial ones hmm. because religion has become a political identity exactly. a marker of your ethnic group absurdly yeah then the shabu is always looked at what you can see look what he's wearing look at his facial hair look at her look how much she's covered and so on yeah yeah so that's the only thing and when it comes to those things imitation essentially the shabu is to do with that which is particular to disbelief hmm I'm talking about the outward yeah, appearance yeah, yeah. at the moment. So any outward appearance that is particular to disbelief. Yes. And it is known as a symbol of disbelievers. Not of a subculture within British culture. Okay. But something that is particular. So... Right? So wearing a dog collar, for example. Yeah. So priests yeah. wear a dog collar. We start wearing a dog collar and we look like priests. Yeah. That's but then if that dog collar then became part of hipster culture... Where it's not particular to kufr anymore, yeah. then there's not a shabu bil kufr. Mm, okay, okay. Makes yeah? sense, yeah. So it's a, sh- it's a shifting, it, it goes along with the shifting nature of culture. Mm. Because here, what is muhakkam? Al urf, it's the culture itself. When I say muhakkam, what's the decisive thing on which we're basing all of this? What's yeah. the illa? What's the, the legal rationale behind it? It's what is deemed as 
being particular to a group's uh, to a religious yes. group's mm-hmm. identity, or it might be an ethnic group, but which is particularized to a particular form of kufr. Okay. Then fine, but other than that, things shift all the time. Exactly. So you might even have a flag that's seen as a cross. Yeah. Yeah, and it's seen as this is a Christian flag. Yeah, yeah. But then over time, they add some more lines, and it becomes actually six or like there's lines all over the yeah. place. Is this particular to Christianity? No, actually, it's in a secular age. It's just an identity for a particular group of people. Exactly. Then why is that flag going to be considered in any way an alama, mm-hmm. a symbol, a sign of kufr? It's not mm-hmm. of disbelief. So it goes this way. Now, what's interesting is there's other forms of tashabbu. Like. So, for example, the Prophet. Uh, so it's narrated that the Prophet so a curse, curse. la'ana Rasulullah curse. The person who, uh, the man who imitates women and the woman who imitates men. Okay. Yeah. Now, they say, oh, wearing an earring. You read yeah. my mind, because this is a big one now. Yeah, yeah. This is a... Wearing an earring is, is what? <laughs> it's imitating. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not, no, I'm not going to, I'm not getting into, so what I'm saying right now is particular to what I'm saying. Yeah, of I'm course. not getting into halal and haram about earrings. Yes. I'm looking at the system of reasoning behind it. Okay. If the system of reasoning is a man with a stud in his ear, yeah. or, you know, you get like the hipster, you know, the big black circles. The, what they call they called? them? Stretchers. Oh, uh, the stretchers, right? Yeah. So if you've got one of those, you're imitating a woman. Well, clearly in society, that's not the case. Yes. Well, in my culture it is, but your culture is not here. Culture is something you bought here. Exactly. Yeah. And that's another big question that people don't seem to engage with. Even a lot of people who are in the realm of ifta, mm-hmm. right? When you say al-urf, is muhakkam. Yeah. Yeah. Customs have legal weight. Yeah. Or consideration in Islamic law. Who's custom? And when you live in a post-industrial or an industrialized society, which is multicultural, multi-faith, mm-hmm. a plural society, who's custom? Mm-hmm. Now, I've heard people of ethnic background say, well, it should be the demographic that's the biggest majority of Muslims. Right? But then what ends up happening, you have this cultural imposition, for example, because the majority of people here, might, Muslims in this country, might be Pakistani and Bangladeshi. Yeah. You have the cultural imposition of Pakistani and Bangladeshi norms that aren't necessarily yeah. religious on the Nigerian Muslim, the Algerian Muslim, the Somali Muslim, exactly. the Albanian, Kosovan, uh, Bosnian Muslim, the English Muslim, the Scottish Muslim, you know, and so on. I'm yeah. talking about culturally speaking. So... Is that fair and is that just? And why should that be the case? Surely it's about the place. Because they say no, but it's about what the Muslims think. Surely it's about what everybody thinks. Yeah. And Muslims only make up 45 million people. There's another 70 million <laughs> whose considerations there are to take in place. Yeah. Or do you live in a bubble and you don't care? So as long as you look like a man to your people. But say you look like a man to your people, but everyone else thinks you're a woman. You're transgender. <laughs> yeah. You fall into that problem. Exactly. Now, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's what ends up happening. So you have a guy who's standing there in a yeah. long thaw. <laughs> yeah. As a sign of religiosity yeah. And says Hey you You look like a woman And he turns around And says Well you're in a maxi dress <laughs> <laughs> You're in a maxi dress But you're telling me About my one stud Because to 7 million people You're dressed like a woman And you actually look Like a drag queen At the moment <laughs> <laughs> you know, let, Let's be frank right? I'm, I'm not mocking I'm talking about The re- cultural realities Of the situation Yeah it's true You're in, you're in a dress Yeah yeah, in a long maxi dress. And you know, you've got the surma on. Yeah. So you say, oh, you look like a drag queen. You've got eyeliner on. <laughs> and you've got a dress on. To them, you are like a woman. Yeah. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And to a lot of Muslims who are culturally Western, yeah. and maybe haven't been raised around that. Exactly. They will ask, why is he wearing eyeliner for? Yeah, exactly. Yeah? Yeah. So, all right, fine for you. That's all oh, in the desert. They did that to protect their eyes. But cousin, do you see any sand? Because <laughs> <laughs> the Sahara is like 5,000 kilometers or miles that way, yeah. right? So these are the questions that come up. These are the considerations for people to make. And when they're making these bombastic claims about imitating disbelievers or, you know, um, dress codes or what we eat or what we, you know, how we talk. Yeah. By whose standards are you judging those? Because surely they should be by societal standards. Oh, but society is so depraved. But that begs a necessary question. See, there's a solution to all of that, those problems. Which is? Society is so depraved. How can you use society standards? We must use our ethnic standards. Well, number one, again, if you come from India, you want me to use Indian standards? Look at the BJP at the moment. <laughs> it is overrun with like, extremist Hindus just killing everybody exactly. at the moment, right? And like, if you're not talking about that and you're talking about here, what exactly are you selling me? Hmm. Your particular culture that you formed in your house and in your insular community, but thank you, I'm not a part of that. Yeah. Right? Is that what you're imposing on me? So we're not left in this conundrum. So, but there is one answer to it. I'm comfortable and I'm fine. I think things are perfectly wonderful here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I don't feel the need to immigrate. I am a Westerner. Yeah. So I didn't appropriate this culture. I didn't take it in. I'm just born and raised this way. Yeah. So that's the first point. If you feel it's so bad, it begs the question, then why are you here? Exactly. Because w- whether I'm a Westerner or not, so I could be Canadian, but if I feel, felt Canada was that bad, I wouldn't live there. Exactly. There's a reason why people are swimming across the Mediterranean trying to get here. Because where they are is that bad. Yeah. Right? I'm not necessarily talking about morally. I'm just saying, is that bad a situation for them? Yeah. If it was that bad a situation for me that I believe is deeply immoral and depraved. Yeah. And I'm a parent. Why would I raise my kids here? Yeah. My kids are very young, but why would I raise them here? Oh, because of the sterling. So I would sell out my children's future for money. Mm. That's the question. And I think when you start to ask yourself those difficult questions, so why am I here? And and then you start then you have to actually list. Okay, where would I go? I'd go here. Okay. So how is that for education? How is that for health? How is that for even morals and standards? And a lot of the time you and I both know more because we spent time in the Middle East. What people think of the Middle East <laughs> is not what yeah, it is at all. It's not what it is at, at all, all in, in at reality. All. And the big hype that people have hijra. Of living Make there hijra. is because they spent Four days in a Shamu Sheikh <laughs> on the resort, uh, on a resort in the Red Sea, exactly. for example. Or they went to Mecca, Medina, and stayed at the Five Star Meridian or something. Yeah. They don't always like to live there, exactly. or raise your kids in schools there, and live normal life and go and pay bills and have to do shopping. The vast majority of people have never lived in the Middle East who talk about this wonderful, this is immoral, and that is amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then and the people who do, they what they do, they identify and discover their Britishness, <laughs> and they come back waving, you know, the Union Jack. They're like, hey, I'm home now. So a lot of these, again, going back, they're anxieties. Mm. 